Good evening. My name is Bonnie Raskin, and I'm the program director for the Caroline D. Bradley Scholarship at the Institute for Educational Advancement. Thank you so much for joining us this evening in person and online. If this is your first time at a gifted support group meeting, we essentially develop these meetings to provide a safe and open forum for parents and educators of gifted children to share their experiences and also provide an opportunity for you to learn from experts in the field who are willing to share their knowledge from working with gifted children. Our GSGs are hosted once a month during the school year, either in person at our offices in Pasadena or online with a new topic and gifted expert every month. In order to expand our outreach to non-local families who aren't able to attend in person or online, we will share the recording tonight of our presentation via our YouTube channel. The link to the recording will be made public on our IEA website as well. To tell you a little bit about the Institute for Educational Advancement, we are an organization that's dedicated to working with gifted young people from preschool through high school and beyond. And we have a wonderful roster of summer programs that we still have some openings. So please, if you're interested for your children, look on our website at educationaladvancement.org for information about our academy program, which is taught in Pasadena and online. We have three sessions this summer that are open to children from early age preschool right on through middle school with wonderful class offerings that are taught by content area specialists in very small classes and a lot of individual attention. Our roster of all our classes is available, so please check it out. We also have two wonderful camps for gifted children aged 10 to 14 that's called UNASA. Our Colorado camp is full, but we do have some openings still in our Michigan camp, and the camps run each for a week. So please check it out. Um, our kids love our programs, and you can read all about them online. So again, welcome to our program. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lynn Lim, who is the Dean of Students and Communications at Bridges Graduate School. She also serves on several nonprofit gifted related boards, including GHF, Quark Collaboration Institute, and Gifted Education Family Network, and is the current president of SANG. During this presentation, Lynn will share human developmental perspectives on nurturing complex outliers toward resiliency, well being, and flourishing through our life journeys. Dr. Lim, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, we'll do the best we can with virtual and um, in person and virtual. Uh, and without further ado, um, I really want to get through this presentation so we could get to the best part, which is questions and answers and you know co connecting with everybody. OK. An animal schooled a tail of gifts. Once upon a time, a school was formed for animals to learn skills needed in our future world. Swimming, flying, climbing, and running were chosen as the subject areas. To be fair, all students were to participate in three out of the four areas and be at least average in the subjects they chose. Ariel was an excellent swimmer, an average runner, and a very poor climber. Gariel had to stop working on swim moves, which Gariel enjoyed doing, in order to spend more time on learning to climb. 
At the end of the school year, Gloriel managed to get average grades as it was the goal at school. Everyone thought Gariel was doing just fine. However, Gariel was worried about losing an edge in swimming. Booger Glider Possum was excellent at flying, leaping and gliding from treetops. However, Eagle, the instructor, said the right way of flying was from the ground up. Sugar Glider Possum spent so much time practicing ground takeoffs. Sugar Glider Possum was too exhausted to do anything else. At the end of the school year, Sugar Glider Possum had below average grades and was labelled a failure at school. Mare, the arboreal cat, started as a top and popular student. Other animals welcomed Marge, as Marge looked like the leopards already at school. Marge soon became bored with classes, but still enjoyed the company of other students. Marge was labelled a troublemaker for having a different way to complete tasks and having different interests from the leopards. Marge often spent time in detention and was told to be more like the leopards. By the end of the year, Marge earned good grades as it was far too easy. A copy was a new student from a faraway land. No one had ever met an animal like a copy. As a copy looked familiar and yet not. The ponies, zebras, and other animals often made fun of a copy. Even though a copy seemed fine, a copy's grade suffered from being picked on and from the social isolation. The peacock mantis shrimp who lived in the water, running, climbing, swimming and flying, were all the same. Peacock mantis shrimp's great passion was boxing. But the subject was not taught at the animal school. Peacock mantis shrimp dropped out before the end of the year. With the encouragement of those that believe in peacock mantis shrimp's passions and gifts outside of the school, peacock mantis shrimp found joy. Peacock mantis shrimp practiced and ended up having one of the fastest and most powerful punches in the animal kingdom. Bumblebee was the biggest problem of all. Bumblebee was an animal the school could not handle. What are we going to do with Bumblebee? said the teachers 
and classmates. We just don't understand. How can Bumblebee learn to fly? Bumblebee's wings are too small for such a body size. Bumblebee did not pay attention to the other's words. And Bumblebee continued practicing. Over time, Bumblebee began to fly, just like Bumblebee's ancestors. In the end, the school worked for some animals, but not for others. How can we make sure our schools are helping all students grow? Our children are precious. Just like snowflakes, similar yet unique. Possessing different gifts interests, and personalities. It is our job to find opportunities for gifts and interests to shine and grow. When we nurture diversity, strengths and gifts. Our children will be best prepared to flourish. In a future world we have yet to encounter. Our seeds planted will help them to grow. I hope you guys enjoyed the little um, video. It was done in specific fonts, like dyslexic fonts. You know, we had narration, and it is a free resource, which I'll share, uh, you know, together with the um, presentation later on. And moving forward, what that showed before is really just a very simplistic way to talk about how we are all different. Um, it's easy to see how we're different and sort of value different strengths in, in, um, in different animals. However, think about if we're different, not from the anatomy, but from other, other things inside that is not as obvious. Uh, it makes it a lot more difficult to see that. It, it, you know, we can see from here is, you know, of course we should nurture strengths for the different animals because they have different strengths and anything that we spend time practicing we do get better at. Uh, the question is, on a holistic basis, what do we what do we spend time practicing um, as a whole? That would make sense. Um, so depending on the situation, it's obviously more complicated than that, but that's sort of um, like a little taste. So a little tiny bit about myself. Um, I have a sort of like a wide range of um, interest and also training. Um, I have a background in human development psychology. And I'm very interested in sort of the interaction between what goes on inside and our outer world. So what happens uh, between the inside, what, what's going on in our heads and our minds and what's going on outside. And can we see what's inside just based on our outside years? Um, we would say that not really um, on there. So a lot of times in school and as parents too, um, we tend to see behaviors, um, and from the behaviors, we sort of infer what's going on inside, uh, but they're not always the same. So that's sort of my interest in um, having two uh, gifted outliers. Uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter. She's almost 17. She'll be 17 next week, actually, and a 15-year-old son. Um, we've been on this journey. I think we found out that um, both of them are gifted, and one is twice exceptional. And what twice exceptional means uh, in a very short um, synopsis is that 
you have high abilities in one or more areas. And at the same time, uh, you have um, areas that are that presents barriers to your abilities um, being able to manifest. Um, and it could be, if it's discrepant enough, it could be uh, a formal diagnosis. A lot of times when a, when a child is very, very bright on the uh, gifted side, uh, you may not get that diagnosis on the other hand. However, that discrepancy between your highs and lows um, presents various. Um, so the two things interact with each other and, you know, what you see is a result of the two sides interacting with each other. So skipping on. <laughs> so human development, what does it mean? So human development, when we're interested in human development, we're really looking at changes over time. So it's not just the slice that you see, but sort of changes over time gives us uh, is the key to what's going on in your child. So a lot of times it's difficult in that moment to really see clearly because we are trying to see patterns over time. So that's what human development um, in general, if we talk about human development, we're really talking about changes over time. Do we see a pattern? What's going on? You know, what's happening from moment to moment, right? What's happening and over time to that. So human beings are complex systems. Um, it may sound like it's basic, but you know that that's a starting point. So my starting point is that human beings are complex systems, and what does that mean? Complex systems, if you think about it, would be something three dimensional. Uh, it's dynamic. They interact. All the pieces interact with each other. So it's sort of like it, it, it's. Um, could change over time. If you make a tweak in something small, something big could happen. So it's over time, the relationships are just as important uh, between understanding components. So understanding your child's strengths and challenges are understanding the component parts, like understanding what your child likes or doesn't like. Um, the other thing is, well, how does the likes and doesn't like or not things that they don't like interact when you're interacting with your child? So the relationships, between the components are uh, within a complex systems perspective, just as important. So it's not just sort of like your character and, and your child's character, but sort of how you both interact and that interaction and the quality of the interaction is really key. Um, or, or we see it as really key too. There is an emergent quality. So what that means is understanding the individual parts uh, does not, when you add all the individual parts and all the knowledge of, of the individual parts, it doesn't explain the whole. So something happens and it's called an emergent quality that when these parts interact, it creates something completely different. So a good example or analogy would be, for example, twice exceptionality using a color analogy. If your strengths are yellows and your challenges are blues, this, a twice exceptional child is not yellow, and blue, it's green. It's the interaction between the two colors. And green has different qualities and sort of behaviors than yellows or blues separately. So that's what we mean by emergent quality. Uh, the butterfly effect um, is uh, something that came out of um, meteorology um, and uh, from physics. It is demonstrated that in complex systems, uh, one tiny change could end up from a system level have huge impact. So it's it's called commonly called the butterfly effect. The good news is that the reverse is true too. So, you know, on the other hand, you can always tweak something. So it's always a interaction between uh, all the parts together. Um, the other parts about if we understand human beings and we buy into uh, the this idea that human beings are complex systems is that it requires multi-stakeholder collaboration. We don't live just by ourselves. In your family unit, you have your different siblings, um, if you have children, how that interacts between siblings, between the parents, uh, between the parents and the child, it requires that whole system to uh, interact with each other. So that's what that means. So this is our inner and outer world. Um, a study that was done in 2007 um, where uh, they did a study where they um, 
had a consensus by multi interdisciplinary experts in different domains as to, you know, what's the connection between our inner and outer world. So these, um, it's a panel of distinguished scientists across disciplines. Um, and it's called the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development. So it's like a whole bunch of different scientists. They, they got together and they all agreed in general these, um, on these major domains of human development uh, that are social, emotional, cognitive, linguistic, and academic pieces are deeply intertwined together with the contextual and our experiences, and that impacts our behavior and our brains. So all of those are interconnected. So what that means is that any part that you tweak impacts all the other pieces too. So that really um, is a powerful idea. Sometimes we feel like we're stuck in this academic or our focus is in you know, certain pieces of it. And um, you may be in a situation that there's nothing much you could do about that, but there are all these other areas you could tweak. And within a complex dynamic system, that could create changes throughout the, the rest of the pieces that you currently may not be able to have any control over. Um, so with this idea then, and this way of thinking about um, who we are and how we um, operate, uh, intelligence is not equal to giftedness, uh, which if you define giftedness as a, a, a state of being, and it's also not the same, they're not equal to gifted behavior, which tends to be a, an output-based type of definition of giftedness. So there are many different, many, many, we know, um, different definitions and thinking about giftedness. Um, no experts uh, agree on, you know, they're just different definitions. So knowing what definition are we operating from um, gives us an idea of, you know, how to approach things or how we might want to approach things. So complex outliers, who are complex outliers? And you know, why would we call them complex outliers? So if you use a standard um, IQ chart, um, outliers would be, you know, the ones outside. Uh, complex outliers would include, for example, the profoundly gifted, which is at least, well, the definitions vary, but it's at least three standard deviations away. So if you have a child that has um, an IQ of, Let's say she's 11, she has an IQ of 174. That means her chronological age would be 11. Her mental age could be like an average 20 and a half year old person. If you have some, a child like that, think about it. She's physically 11, but she's able to think like an average 20 year old. That's an asynchrony, sort of like the spikiness of it, um, you know, how is that child different or not from another child that has less discrepancies on there? So the, the greater that you are of an outlier, does it qualitatively change anything? And we'll see in the next slide. It's something for you to think about. Um, these are four different general types. Um, so we have the profoundly gifted, which are like if you just look at it like extreme on one side, the twice exceptional are um, could be extreme of, on both sides or sort of like combinations of discrepancy. So it's, it could be like this or like this, you know, something like that. Uh, the profoundly gifted and 2E would be the ones that are on the extreme, you know, outliers. And then adding on to the complexity would be if you are either any one of those above and part of a marginalized group or an underserved community, uh, low income, refugee, um, cultural minority, gender uh, minority, or anything like that, that adds on to the complexities of um, their experience. <laughs> so using that color um, color pairing, which I had used before as, as, as a way to describe, right? Green is sort of different from yellow and blue. Um, they seem to have, they have different qualities. So adding on to that's from Baum et al, which is our provost at our graduate school using her metaphor. What I did is I add, added on um, to that's a complex dynamics um, kind of application of this basic idea that um, all of us, hum all humans have variabilities in our abilities. And 
when you have the the variabilities in areas that we feel are you know we have strengths in areas we feel like we have more challenges in a lot of times these are relative and in uh when it becomes an extreme more discrepant cases that's when you have that those labels like the profoundly gifted the twice exceptional and stuff like that what happens with that is that in itself interacts with uh, what's going on in our environment and also what's going on with ourselves, the neuro psycho physiology of ourselves as we're growing and aging, you know, there are certain um, sort of things that happen in our brain and our bodies, all of those interact uh, all the time. And what we see is this variability on, as behaviors that we can see on the outside. So if you think about it, that same behavior on the outside could be caused by a lot of different things, go, different combinations of different things going on inside that we don't, that we may or may not be able to see. So the analogy I have would be, well, if you are ice, um, water, and steam, they are the same thing. They're made of the same ingredients. However, are they the same quality or are they different? Like when they're in state of ice, water, and steam, you know, they don't behave the same way. So is giftedness something like that? You know, something to think about. Um, and if we do understand giftedness as being different states of water, and you know, even though you're made up of the same ingredients, something is different about that. So um, this is what you know. This is what I prescribe to when we talk about giftedness. Um, So this is another uh, visual. So remember we did the color pairing. I did a few different experiments using primary colors. And the point is, if you look at them, they're different shades of the different proportions. And that uh, is an analogy for very different behaviors that you see as a result. So if you see the different shades under very different conditions, you could see a very different child depending on what's going on. And all those adds on to the complexities. And that's for younger um, parents. That's a, a, a good, we call it the color lab. So that's like a good conversation to talk about what areas are your strengths that they feel are their strengths. You might have different ideas. So the color lab would be an activity if you have younger kids to start the conversation on, you know, how we're all different. We have different areas we feel more comfortable about. Maybe we have different areas that we feel like, you know, that's like, yeah, that's like my strength areas or not. Um, and it's a fun way to kind of, uh, talk about differences in a kind of more safe way, you know, with the children. And it's always fun. Um, so here's another one where uh, when people talk about strengths and challenges too, it's not an absolute thing. So uh, strengths and challenges, depending on the situation, a specific diagnosis or trait could be uh, an advantage or it could be a disadvantage. It really depends on what it is. So for example, if somebody says that um, you are, you know, you're, you're like, you're too careful or like you're perfectionistic. Think about it. If you are having a neurosurgery, would you want your doctor to be like pretty much perfectionistic? You know, but perhaps that's not very uh, adaptive if, if it's just like everyday life because you may not even get out of the house because you're trying to be like, you know, make everything look perfect. So again, a lot of what we consider as strengths and challenges are really contextual. So we want to think about it a little bit more broadly to that. Um, so the next perspective really has you thinking that, you know, our mind, body, brain, and the relational pieces of things and the contextual, which is our environmental, like what's going on, uh, create our um, important factors that impact the outcome, whatever it is that we're seeing at the moment. So this is an educational affective and behavioral profile using a twice exceptional child as an example. Um, these are some behaviors you might see a twice exceptional child. And what happens with this is the output, the behaviors that you see. And as we interact within this um, sort of complex dynamic systems, when with the, you may see a child that uh, educationally 
presents as their challenges greater than their gifts. So I use the yellow or the blue to show that that child who is gifted may come across in the classroom or perform in a way that doesn't show any gifts, challenges more than the gifts. Or depending on what's going on, even though you see the same outward behavior, this another child could uh, or even the same child, depending on what classes it is and stuff, could, um, you know, you don't see the gifts. They cancel each other out. And then in another case, you could, uh, those are the different possible states where you could see the gifts um, compensating the challenges. So overall, you kind of see a bright child, uh, and it could be a bright child that maybe isn't living up, that's not able to perform to his or her abilities. Um, for a twice exceptional child, because they are compensating for their, um, the challenges on there. So the dynamic part of it is this profile, uh, what the same child could be in any of this profile uh, between different contexts or throughout the day, depending on what subjects, depending on you know, what's going on on there. So when we are um, assessing a child and looking at a child, when we look at a child under different conditions and over time, we get a better picture as to what's going on with this child. So if you see a child that is uh, has performance inconsistencies, or this child is like completely different behavior um, and uh, performance in within different classroom setting on different subjects, that tells us that it's possible that something is going on that is preventing this child from uh, being able to be more consistent throughout, you know, the different classes and environments. So what do we know about the brain, reasoning, and emotions? Um, neuroscience is telling us, um, it is, um, has evidence that when information comes into, from the outside, into our, into our minds, it gets processed in two ways. Um, one way is called the low road or the um, or system one. Different people call them different things, but it's processed in two, two different routes at the same time. The faster route goes through the emotional parts of our brain. And then there's the high road or system two that is processing, that gets processed through the frontal lobe, which is where our rational thinking, executive functioning, and all the higher level thinking goes through. So what that tells us um, is that all of us, every one of us, our children and ourselves are really emotional creatures that think. So understanding that emotions color what we see and do and think all the time, because the very first thing that happens is it gets processed here first, then it gets further processed further down. And what happens after that is that the frontal lobe may then come back and give additional information to regulate the emotional response. In some cases, uh, a child, and it has nothing to do with your high ability to reason and think about it, sometimes they may want to uh, regulate their emotions, but the emotional reaction is so great and the physiological um, responses is so great, sometimes um, the child is not able to do that. And it's not a matter of the child not wanting to. So it's not a will. It's often a skill because they don't know how to yet to do that. And that's a very different way to look at our children, especially when they're acting out or sort of like, you know, not doing things you want. Um, if you look at it as, you know, something is going on to prevent them, anyone who can do well will want to do well. And if they're not doing well, let's look to see what's getting in the way of this child to do well, uh, that's a very different perspective that we're already bringing to the table on that. Oh, which I just said already. Kids do well if we can, Ross Green. Um, if you don't know Ross Green, go get his books. Um, you know, I think he uh, does, you know, wonderful work. Um, he writes in a very accessible way. So Ross Green, kids do well if we can, which is, you know, could be like an assumption, but. I think that's a good assumption to go with instead of like, oh, they're doing it on purpose. You know, no, they, they are not able in their, you know, to do whatever it is at, in that moment in time. So one example of that is this visual simulation. Oh my gosh, this looks so scary, right? Big, scary, big emotions. And it's like, oh my God, you know, what's going on? 
well, this is what happens. This is what is in context. Okay, this is my child. This is a real one. <laughs> okay, that's what happens. You know, it's so on the left. You're like, oh my God, this giant thing, right? And then you see the right, oh. If you are able to see it in context, you go like, oh, it's not that bad. I mean, yeah, it's scary. So, however, sometimes this is what your child is feeling, even though that is the actual situation. And it, it, they're not always able to regulate it, see it that way. So if, if we, you know, if you are in that situation, telling your child to like, come down or like, stop crying is not going to help because they're not able to do that. So giving the example of my own son, he would hyperventilate okay, when he has a meltdown, which is not which is bad because I'm like, oh my God, he's going to fade because, you know. So when I told him uh, without knowing all this before, I'm like, you need to slow down your breathing. That made him hyperventilate even more. And until we kind of understood it as, oh, it's not because he really was trying to be funny or whatever, he really couldn't. And by highlighting to him what was going wrong, he hyper-focused on that and he like made it worse. So what we ended up doing trial by error was that when he was in that situation, it was easier to just hug him, moving out of that position, go somewhere where he felt like, you know, cuddly blankets or whatever, and just like, just have his body come down before we talk about whatever else that was going on. Um, and it's, again, something like that. Um, I want to talk just real briefly about positive psychology. Like, what is positive psychology? I'm sure a lot of you heard about it. Uh, there's a lot of misconception and misunderstanding of what positive psychology is. So positive psychology is an added lens. So it's what happens when you go to zero, or zero would be like, average, whatever that means, right? Prior to positive psychology, when we talk about what's going on and everything, it's all about fixing. It's all about like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Uh, let's get you from negative to zero. And that was the main purpose of psychology, therapists, and all that stuff. Positive psychology isn't saying that that's not important. They're saying that, well, once you get to zero, or for people that are at zero, do we just end there? You know, or could we go even more? Flourishing, well-being, sustainability. So that's what positive psychology um, is about in a nutshell, that uh, we study, you're interested to study, not just sort of like, you know, how do you get from negative to zero? Not that it's not important. There's a lot of people doing that already. We're studying how do we go above zero to go up uh, more and to uh, have sustainable well-being, find meaning in life, and um, have a long, uh, meaningful life. So a positive psychology applications is um, these three areas have been found through different empirical studies that, you know, positive emotions, and it doesn't have to be large emotions, it's just positive ones, like feeling contented or, you know, mild positive emotions impact uh, not just our how we see things, perceived, right? How we would approach things. So think about it like a lens. If you're wearing those sunglasses, you know, I you, at one point I really enjoyed wearing those rose sunglasses because everything looked sort of had that tint on it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And it kind of made me feel good. Um, so it sort of has that effect. Positive psychology, positive emotions will impact how we perceive things. So if you're in a good mood, everything seems to you would approach things more positively, even with bad things. You sort of like are calmer. You just sort of, it, it, it just colors everything you see. Base, uh, baseline, uh, vagal tone is often used within um, experiments as a proxy for physical health. It's found uh, positive emotions and positive thinking and things like that have found to have impact physical health too, on top of mental health. And there are enough studies at this point that um, you can look up to go, wow, that's amazing. It's like, well, you know, if, we, if I try to think more positively and try to increase more positive uh, emotions or the experience of positive emotions, it doesn't have to be large positive emotions, it's more frequent experiences of positive emotions that actually has physical implications. And uh, it helps me to also, um, perceive things differently. That's powerful. Guess what? It's free. You don't have to go buy anything. 
it's doable. You may take practice because, you know, especially if we're not used to doing it, it does take time to practice. Over time, it becomes sort of like part of our practice, sort of part of who we are um, and all that. And uh, this physical part will be things like sleep is important. Uh, is your child hungry? I know I, I'm not like that, but my husband is he turns into a monster when he's hungry. So when he's suddenly snippy, I'm like, did you eat? Like not, you know, but more like, oh, these are like the, the things I, I'm aware of that sort of like that I notice. And he's like, oh yeah, I skipped lunch. I'm like, you need to eat your lunch, <laughs> buddy. Um, so things like that. Uh, awareness of our mind, brain, and body. So give me an example. Uh, my son, who is twice exceptional and he's autistic, he, uh, in elementary school, in public school, we, we were in a relatively small public school. However, um, at that time, we were just finding out like he had sensory sensitivity and things like that. Uh, he started uh, in, only in public school, we noticed. And again, it's over time, right? We didn't know till later, but like, oh, huh, that's interesting. During the second semester, he would often start having, um, would say that he's ill in the morning, that he doesn't feel well. And then, you know, we would keep him, whenever we kept him at home, I would realize that he's actually not like physically sick or anything like that. Um, because we, in our case, because of our needs, um, we've had to make changes in schooling on average every uh, year and a half to two years, because he either, if you're in an enriched environment that's suitable to him, he outgrows the school. It, and then reverse is true, if he's in a really bad situation, it's just really terrible for him. So because we had um, switched different types of schooling to uh, over time, I noticed that, you know, I think his uh, psychosomatic symptoms were a sign, even though he wasn't cognitively aware, it was a sign for his body to say that it's not a suitable environment. It only occurred the two big chunks of time we went back to public school. And it always occurs in the second half of the semester for my son. It takes him any changes in the environment, like different schools and stuff. It takes him on average one whole semester to kind of get used to everything. So it's sort of once he gets used to everything, then we start seeing other things <laughs> manifest, whether it's great stuff or sort of like eh, something's going on type of thing. So this is what I mean by. Um, the lens. On the left is a photo I took. So it's, it, it's assuming that's reality because you took a photo. On the right is my daughter's interpretation of that same picture. You can tell it's like the you know, overall stuff is sort of the same, but very different affect if you're going to like describe it, right? You'd be like, oh, well, this one sounds, it looks just so much happier. Or, you know, if you look at it, her focus is this is much bigger, it's not so cloudy, and stuff like that. That's what we mean by the positive emotions and our emotional states really colors what we see. You know, on that. The other thing would be different people may go, I mean, for some people, you may go, this is the most interesting thing. So in your mind, if you had to recreate this, that could be like giant. Um, so all those are uh, subjective, what's inside our mind, how we experience certain things. A lot of times it isn't something we could really, we have the in instinctive, like a reactionary thing. Um, oftentimes, even though we know we shouldn't be upset, um, I was sharing with um, Cheryl, sharing with Cheryl that uh, recently I just found out that, you know, my son and I had very different ideas of what uh, immediately means. So immediately to me was like, you know, right away, like within whatever, two minutes. His interpretation of immediately was like 20 minutes later. And he really thought so, that he was immediate. It wasn't, but, you know, it, at, in the moment, it, it we were trying to rush off somewhere, so it got me really, um, even though I knew I shouldn't be, I couldn't help it. That was just how I felt. So how we feel is natural as if we just can't help it, because remember, the processing that happens to us is what? Emotional, right? Then what I then try to do over time as adults is, you know, I'm like, okay, let myself you know, come down from the situation. And then we had a talk about it. Uh, so once we figured out, okay, immediate, when you decode it for him equals 20 minutes, I'm like, I'll just adjust. Or we can adjust in the future to do that. 
So this is one technique that you can use. It's called the one on the top right. It's called the um, active constructive responding. This is a positive psychology uh, technique that is used specifically only when sharing good news. So you don't use this when it's not good news. So when somebody shares positive things that they are excited with you, what you do with this technique is that you actively engage the person in um, you know, inviting them to share more about it, why are they so excited? Doesn't matter if you're not excited or not, but you share in their excitement. And what that does is we're um, taking a positive um, emotions to try to amplify it. So we try to stretch it out. We try to amplify it by engaging in that person. Um, and that's something that you, we can do. It may not come naturally. I did that for one of my classes. It was not my... Um, I think I was more of a passive constructive type of person in general. Um, so it was, it took a little bit for me to engage in that. And what I found out with my daughter, uh, and my daughter is a um, quiet person in general. So she doesn't share a lot of stuff, um, you know, and then when she's really, really excited about something, then she'll share. So, uh, but through that engagement, because I had to do it as an assignment um, and we did that, I found out certain things that I never knew. And it was uh, perhaps uh, subjective on my part, but I did feel like after the engaging in that, because she was my uh, practice partner to practice this, that our quality, because my daughter is all the way in Virginia in college. So the only way we do is over the phone, right? And you can't force her to talk. So I'm like all the way far, far away. So uh, I did feel that after that, that our, the quality of our um, conversations got much better. You know, with her. And she was much more open. With her, with me. So practical parenting applications, and then we can um, the Q and A would be be aware of the emotional state, not just yours, uh, yours and your child's. Right? Sometimes it's you, sometimes your child. So it may not be the best time to talk about important things or kind of debrief what happened and all that. Uh, are you responding with re reactively, which is the emotional part, right? Reactive responses. Um, you may or may not want to engage in it once you're aware that, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, responding in a reactive way or a more reflective way, which is system two, the slow thinking sort of, you know, uh, higher level cognitive processes. We want to reframe to gain. Anytime we talk about, you can talk about the same thing, like the glass half empty or half full. If we can find a way to talk about something in a gain perspective, uh, people tend to be more open to that. Nobody likes to lose something, you know, even if it's the same equivalent. So if, if you have any way to frame something as a gain, um, that could help you. And also from a systems perspective, I actually advocate for aiming for the smallest tweak. Don't do 5,000 things, don't even try two things. Uh, try one thing at a time, because when you tweak one thing in a complex systems, you know, you, it's the more things you tweak at the same time, you really can't tell what was effective, what worked, what didn't work, and things like that. So um, it may feel like, oh my God, I'm not doing enough. I want to just do, just try everything under the sun. So hopefully something will work. Is that with uh, white kids, sometimes that backfires. Like in my son's case, we were um, trying to do a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff. Partly early in our journey, we didn't know, and we were. Uh, made to feel like, oh my God, if you don't do stuff, it's going to be too late, you know, to stop type of stuff. And it really stopped me in my tracks when my son said one day, and he's never said that. He said, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what do you mean, honey? He's like, well, why am I going to all these therapies? And why am I going to all these assessments? That really stopped me in my tracks that um, because I saw that he never thought anything was wrong with him and nothing is wrong with him. But because I was doing, like, overdoing it, initially, high-ability kids, they think deeply. He was like, whoa, something's going on. You know, uh, once he said that, it really stopped me in my tracks. And from a human development perspective, if you think about it, I thought I was running out of time. But really, my son was eight and a half. When you think about the whole lifespan, it's not that much time. More time if I took you know, three months or something to really think about what's going on or sort of investigate, maybe um, do more research about it or read about it before I did something else. So when you think on a human development perspective and we're able to zoom out, uh, it gives you this uh, agency that uh, you don't, 
even though we feel like we need to rush, it's also on the other hand, depending on the complexities, uh, you have to, you know, to do that. And then the other thing about preceding event happens is that it impacts is that, okay, if your son had a really bad day in school, and you come home, just like if you had a bad day, you were so tired from work, when you come home and then somebody else starts something, whatever it is, you're probably gonna be like, no, you know, because you're having such a bad day already. So just being aware that it's not, a lot of times the reaction we're getting may, may not be to the thing. It could be they came back from something else uh, that's already difficult for them. And then on top of that, you're, at, you're requesting something that's very difficult for them too. Uh, that the behavior isn't always just like, you know, to you, it's carrying on all this stuff. So what happens at school does get brought into the home. What happens at home does get brought into the school too, um, to do that. Amplify positive emotions. And then the collaborative relationships through strengths is as much as possible. We wanted to find opportunities for all of your child's strengths to um, have chances to be practiced. Remember, whatever you practice in, you're going to get better at. So we want to be um, strategic because we can't do everything under the sun and your child has limited time and resources and so do you and energy. What are you going to spend time with? It's not that you only want to spend time with strengths, but you want to as appropriate, depending on the case. For example, my son still has a hard time tying shoelaces. He's 15. Are we gonna spend more time learning to tie shoelaces? Well, he could wear them over, it's not the end of the world. However, if it is a skill that um, you know can be addressed and makes a huge difference, you may it will it may make sense. It really depends. So the easy, there's no easy answer, is I guess the bottom line to all of this. Um really complex in that the NAS trifecta um, it means is that there are three components uh, for successful parenting. The three, which is a triangle, if you look at it, um, it's a little abstract, but education, right? You need to know what, you need to know what are the different methods and, and you know, reflect on what makes sense to you. There's no real right or wrong answer. Everyone's different, our culture is different, our family values are different, you know, all those other stuff. However, the education piece will allow you more information to process, to figure out how do you apply it, you know, trans, how do you translate it to what works for your family or not? And you're in charge and you have to make that difficult decision because you have the most information about your children. Support consolation means what? As a parent, uh, parent support, um, you know, peer groups to support you, especially when you have outliers, um, other parents who don't have similar um, experiences, they may not get what you're doing, you know, even though they might be your best friend, they might be of best intention, when they, because their child is very different, they may not understand all the things you're going through. So uh, parent support, peer support for yourself uh, is important because, uh, you know, we need to make sure that our cup is recharged so that we can support, in, be in a good position mentally and physically to support our, our children. So that includes things like self-care, things like that. We're not trying to be selfish, but if you're so tired, you're not going to be the best state of mind to help your children. So those are important. Mentorship, what does that mean? Mentorship would be for, uh, in order to see the future, we can't know the future because we're not there. So mentorship could take the form of many forms of uh, other parents that have gone on in your journey a little bit further along and then we kind of pay it backwards and um, so that's what mentorship means. Mentorship would also be another uh, way to use mentorship would be also for your children who are outliers with very interesting interests that's kind of like not within standard school curriculum. Mentors are the best ways whether it's informal or formal um, museum docents, they love to talk to people who are passionate. My son is really interested in, you know, um, in planes at this moment. The docent, and I don't know anything about him, though I want to be supportive. I just don't know enough. Find those are mentors in a way. It doesn't have to be a long term relationship or anything like that, but find people that can engage because you do need enough content level to engage. Uh, with a child who has really strong interests, you know, to, to, like if, if you're too far off, even though you're, you know, in, in the communication and interest, 
nothing quite happens there too. So it needs to be a certain range to, to do that. So um, a little plug for saying we have today, this was tonight. Uh, it is recorded if you do want to uh, go watch the seminars. Anything that says seminars are recorded. Um, typically we do one of the Tuesdays are the seminars or we might have a same chat. Uh, same chats are not recorded because that's an opportunity for you to ask personal questions with an expert. Uh, we had like um, gifted development center is Linda Silverman visiting, you know, early in January. She is uh, doing a professional development um, and I would highly recommend for new parents, Gifted 101, and it is an APA, not that you need an APA accredited stuff, but, you know, um, it is for like licensed psychologists and all that deep dive into what is giftedness 101 with um, Linda Silverman. We have that. We have, you know, a lot of other other things too, like with other seminars on well-being of advanced young learners. Um, we have Sang Journal, finding of you who want to read more academic type um, materials about you know, social emotional psychology type stuff. It is absolutely free. You could download online. Um, on there, we support the journal so that we can bring it to you free. A lot of the academic journals are very costly, um, you know, but you could do that for free. Uh, we have other things going on, um, you know, um, feel free to join us. We have a, a, a saying um, annual conference coming up. We have Scott Barry Kaufman, who is going to be our keynote, uh, and Richard Cash, and a, and a bunch of other people, including some of EA, EIA's uh, UNASA people, like Sheila Gallagher is supposed to be there. Chris Wells was going to be there, but now there's a conflict. Uh, so, But she is going to record a virtual uh, recording for us. So we're super excited about this. So last uh, but not least, uh, I have my contact information here. I forgot what the QR codes were. <laughs> Something. <else. laughs> um, but I do want to leave you with one of my favorite um, uh, children's book. Uh, it says, these are dark clouds, said the boy. Yes, but they will move on, said the horse. The blue sky above never leaves. So the, the blue sky to me are the gifted kids. That the blue sky behind. Sometimes there are dark clouds that get in the way that we don't see the blue blue sky, or we get caught up in the oh my god, what are we gonna do with our dark clouds? But at some point, the dark clouds um, will leave, and we want to support our children um, it, to see the blue skies that's always there behind the dark clouds on there. So um, I'm gonna stop. I think that's all I have. I'm gonna stop. Recording. I'm like, how do I do that? Great. Yeah. Well, can, I'll stop. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording, but we can now um, have our Q&A sure. section. Yeah. Feel free to ask any questions. It doesn't have to be about the presentation.